Okay. Um, <clears throat> some new CRA pronouncements. Optional filing measure for Part 9, concern with consulting fees and SALT. So what happened is, as we remember last year, there was new reporting requirements. We've got to report our fees, how much we're charging. There was, there was a lot of uproar from the community. that I never really supported it. I saw this coming, and I actually thought it was a good, I was one of the few people who thought this is a great thing. Because those of you who were in our practitioner session about three or four years ago, Remember, there's, there's this guy in the Globe and Mail who keeps writing crazy articles. And, and he wrote this article that said billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is being wasted on shred consultants. That of the $6 billion a year, a third of 35% of that was going to the consultants who prepared the claim. And there's no statistics to back that. So I'm saying, are you kidding me? The big four firms responded that their total billings for SRD for that year were $110 million. I'm saying the big four are a relatively large percentage of that, of the total claims. So I'm saying proportionally, if what he said was true, how could the big four only claim $110 million? They should be over a billion. They should be 10 times or more of that amount. So, I mean, those numbers are ridiculous. There's very few big companies that would pay a third of their total credits to any consultant. I, I can't believe that. Um, <clears throat> or at least, at least at most in a one-time measure, not on a repeated year after year. So how do you defend against that? The CR, because, you know, they came under, the Globe and Mail published this. And I mean, the problem with the Globe and Mail publishing something like that is public opinion. The public doesn't really know what the truth. That, hey, the Globe and Mail, it must be right. And then they're outraged and offended at how the government's mismanaging its tax money. And yet, these are all fallacies. These are, these are just speculation that he made up. He's got no proof for anything he wrote. And yet, you know, people will say, well, it's a global mail. How could they publish something that's unsubstantiated? I'm saying, this, this guy's a terror. He, he really is. <clears throat> but we'll talk about that in a minute. So CRA responded saying, hey, an easy way to do it is have every, rep every claim, uh, claim report the fees. And then we'll total it up. And if after two years it is 35%, well, maybe we got a problem. Maybe we're going to deal with it. CRA says it's looked at the numbers, and he says it said they don't believe there's any problem, that the market is very competitive, and that fees are, are adequate, and that they don't need to intervene at all. They say they're probably, on average, below the 10 to 15 percent range, or maybe even less on, on a whole when you encounter big companies. So, again, <clears throat> this is probably one of the only ways that the CRA can defend itself, or, sorry, not CRA, Department of Finance can defend itself that it is using the money uh, with discretion and that the accusations made by the Globe and Mail are false and unbi un unbased. Okay? So what it says here is practitioners complain saying, well, hey, maybe, maybe I do the SRND claim, but you know, they have another accounting firm that would also like to do the SRND claim. And they're bidding against me every year, trying to steal the job, and we're competing back and forth. And I don't necessarily want to tell the accounting firm, what my billing is, because that gives, you know, no, they can undercut me. They know exactly what to quote. So seriously, that, that's, that's fair enough, fair enough. So what you can do is you can just provide your name and business number on the form with no billing arrangement and submit that separately. Okay? You still have to provide your business number and your name saying, I did the work, but no, but no amount, and you can paper file the form separately with the actual numbers. You're not the only person. There's a lot of practitioners, because I remember being in some of the, they call them stakeholder meetings with CRA. That, that, and this was a big, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like one practitioner. It was a lot of practitioners that were bent out of shape of, of, of this issue. So anyways, that's how they've resolved it. And it seems, you know, I've, I've listed there where you think that's effective, but it seems like something that hopefully that will solve the problem. Yes. Well, I'll tell you a story. 
and many people in the room are probably in the same boat, that about uh, over 10 years ago, I was approached by the BDC to do claims for their clients. And I'm sure, and then half the people in the room probably call, hey, I guess what, I was approached by the BDC. I'm like, I don't want to deal with those guys because they're charging 50% contingency fee forever. And I told them, that, that's not, I argued with the BDC. I remember talking to the senior guy in Toronto and saying, that's not fair to the client. That's not a good, and I'm arguing, I mean, BDC is a crown corporation. I'm arguing with the government. And he told me, no, we did an extensive review across Canada on what the rates were, and the rates are 35 to 50 percent. We're justified on it. And I, ref I said, you know what, I don't want to be involved with this because I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's fair to the taxpayer. I don't fair, think it's fair to the claimant. And it's an unrealistic way to, to, to build it. So, I mean, the government itself are the, are the biggest offenders. The guys when BDC was involved on it, they're the ones who, they're protecting us from themselves, really, at the end of the day. Most practitioners probably weren't charging the same kind of rates. Okay, so the 2013 budget closed off, where they say they, they received all these uh, issues on contingency fees. We kind of talked about it. They said, quote, the market for shred tax preparers is competitive. Contingency fees have declined over time, and there's no evidence this type of billing arrangement results in higher compliance costs for business. No further scrutiny necessary, although we've got to keep filling out the Part 9s for a little bit until, uh, until they get whatever data they need. Self-assessment learning tool, or SALT. Now, basically, I could pop into the internet and download this, but basically, they call it a two-step process. It's funny because I keep hearing how this is going to help and it's going to make it easier for taxpayers. And basically, from what I can tell, and we can download it, is, is it's just the T661 form. <laughs> What's your objective? It's very, if I, I'm not sure what the difference of the SALT form is versus actually just filling out the T661 form itself. It doesn't provide any extra guidance. It's just the three boxes. And then they say submit it. Now, what I think they could use is they could use this to submit it for a pre-claim process review or a first-time claimant or have the CRA at least have something to direct you on where it's going. But really, I, I don't see any advantage to the SALT tool if you look at it as opposed to just printing the, the project template and filling it out. I, I see no additional direction. It's not making you focus on variables. It's, it's not doing anything else that the T661 form does. And they've spent five or six years developing. I don't even want to know how much money's been spent on this. But... Um, I don't know. Try it out and see if we're getting good taxpayer value on developing this tool. I think my recommendation would be take whatever money you're spending on that and put it into something a little more productive at the end of the day. Uh, that's just, again, my feeling. But go ahead and check out that tool. The, the link's right there. Make your own opinion. Can you bump it, Wayne? I seem to be locked. Oh. All right, so there we go. All right, so we'll talk about some of the new tax changes. So not Canada Revenue, these are actual legal changes, either new laws being passed or new laws being proposed by Department of Finance. Um, the first, as we mentioned, is the Tax Court of Canada informal appeal levels have risen, and I think it was June the law was passed, to raise the informal appeal limit, which is like small claims court for tax from $10,000 a year federally, CRA amounts, to $25,000. So effectively, if we have a client that's a qualified corporation and claiming the Ontario credits, the OITC and ORDTC, another 15%, you could technically get $40,000 a year, but that's going to be the limit. So $25,000 federal, the provincial credits would be around another you know, ten dollars to $15,000, depending if you renounce it. So if you have a claim where you say, you know what, I filed an objection and it's been sitting there a year and a half, client's, client's upset, they don't want to do any more SRNED claims until they figure out what happens on this one, standard story, and it's been a year and a half, so now we're going to miss the 18-month deadline, and even if we don't, we've got to go back two years and it's going to be a dog's breakfast to try to pull this together because the client hasn't been maintaining the systems. They've, they've lost all of their impetus to do it. You know, kind of pulled the wind out of their sails. So one of the key things that I found is, what's your recourse? I mean, we have 600 objections that have been sitting there for one, two years, and I've, I've only seen one response. I've only heard of two or three people out of those 600 objections. Have you seen any responses? They've been sitting on them for two years, and every response that we're hearing is confirming the series original assessment. So basically, you, you just wasted two years. 
Um, what you could do is you could file the objection if it's taking too long. You wait 90 days and then you have the right to appeal to the tax court of Canada in formal appeal procedures. And right now the waiting list, when I called them, they said it's around eight months. So if you file today, you're going to be, you're going to be in court having a decision eight months from now. And the decisions happen, boom, right there, day one. You come in with your evidence and you've got to have everything ready and you're going to have a, a, a documented decision that's now public information that you or I can read about. Ooh, here's what's happening. And that's particularly effective because really when I look at complaints and people saying, hey, we've got complaints, I find that most of the complaints deal with the same individuals. There's a couple of individuals that really create a lot of problems within the CRA SRE system. And then there's lots of them who are very good. There's isolated problems. And it's these same individuals that are really creating all the havoc. So I think once you have five or six tax court cases that point the same individuals doing the same problem, CRA is going to have to do something to, to remedy the situation. Well, it's all secretive right now, they don't have to do. There's no impetus to force them to do anything. Once information becomes public, it's a completely different environment. Yes? David, they were supposed to go into a seat, bunch of measures to improve the appeal section. They fired people from what I understand up in Ottawa, and the flow through is supposed to. Have you seen any evidence? Let me address that in two slides. I think exactly the opposite is happening. And I'll, I'll talk about a Globe and Mail article that actually is that I agree with on this one, but, okay. So we're gonna get to that. Okay, um, so we talk about the stock option benefit or denial. There was a case called Alcatel, where, where basically, you know, if you exercise a stock option and you had it, the income included on your tax return, this company Alcatel said, well, even though we don't have an expense on our financial statement, we'll talk about that later, we should be able to claim the amounts that our employees showed on their T4 slip as, as income. So when you exercise a stock option, you know, exercise an option uh, to buy a stock for $50 when it's actually at a fair market value of 100, I have a $50 kind of gain. I, I got a $100 stock for $50. The way the law works is half of that amount goes right into my income as earned income in the year. I have $25 of earned income times, times whatever number of shares I exercised. So I got to pay tax on that right there. What Alcatel did is they went in and said, hey, well, our employees disclosed $4.8 million of taxable income on their T1s, so we're, we're claiming that as SR&ED. And Siri said, you can't claim that as SR&ED. It's not even on your income. Like, that's, you sold the shares, and the person made the money. It didn't, you didn't get any of that money. Like, how, how could you possibly deduct that? It has nothing to do with you. And the, at court, the judge said, no, there was a cost you diluted the ownership of the other owners, and therefore you made it harder to raise capital in the future. I thought, wow, that's, that's brilliant. Like, I'm a tax guy, but I, would, I wouldn't even have thought of that. That's really thinking outside the box. And anyways, what happened is they said, okay, then what happens is when, when there's a judgment that politicians don't like, not CRA, but the politicians don't like, they just change the law. So the Department of Finance came in and said, well, that, that's not really what we intended. So we'll tell you what, up until now, we'll let it go, and then anything after... November 17th, 2005 is out. Okay. Now that law was proposed legislation until recently, right? And it just got passed. And now they're saying, well, in the area where we said it was effective until we actually passed it in 2012, it's all still in. So I believe lots of companies have been playing that game at a very high level because law doesn't become, this doesn't become law until it's actually passed. Proposed legislation is really just that. CRA recommends that you follow it, but it's not law. It's, you can choose to follow it if you like, but you don't have to follow it. So it's interesting to see, just as a precedent, when laws are announced to be proposed to be changed, till the fact that they actually get royal assent could be years, and in the meantime, they're not laws. So there were similar things on the 18-month you know, rule and extensions and all these things where people, until those laws were passed in the last year or two, could still appeal that, because that was just a recommendation. There's new rules on control. These are interesting, because if you look at some of the SRNED cases, there's, there's ones called Bag Tech and Perfect Fry and whatnot. The companies are claiming that they're CCPCs, yet the majority, more than 50% of the shares are owned by foreign parties, votes and value. You see, that, that contradicts the whole definition of a CCPC. How, how could that possibly happen? 
And the way it happens is they use something called a unanimous shareholder agreement to say, okay, even though I own 99% of the votes, I'm going to make you, Mr. Canadian resident, a director, and I'm going to sign a shareholder's agreement that says you're in full authority, you can do whatever you want, and I have no authority to do anything, you're fully in charge. And therefore, even though I own your company, I'm, I'm not really in control of it. And they won. They, they won in court. So I, you know, what am I going to say? So now they brought in new rules that say, well, you know what? If you control more than 75% of fair market value, this new section says that's, you're deemed to control it. Okay? It used to be more than, the law actually right now says more than 50 you're deemed to control. But I guess they were, there was the law and then the interpretation of the law where, where the judges were overruling you know, section 256. So this, in my opinion, is, is really a, a, a look at tightening that up and trying to figure out a me medium point on how do we deal with these guys without offending them too much but not letting them take too much at the same time. So again, more, more advanced tax planning. And they say it's, it's actually to address concerns, according to the Department of Finance, that lost companies are being traded and people are particularly abusing these, these rules.